2 million square kilometers of tiger habitat in the world today, in Asia today, but 55% of that, 55% of that, more than a million square kilometers are vacant. There are no tigers there. And there are no tigers there because they've been poached out and their prey has been poached out. So it is a major problem. Um, and so today we're gonna focus on that poaching problem. And, and yes, poaching of prey is a major problem for tigers, but we're not really gonna talk about that today. It's a bit of a different problem with different, with different causes and different solutions than the poaching of tigers. So today we're gonna to focus on tiger poaching and we're gonna plan a, a, a later session on prey poaching. Um, and a lot of our information on poaching comes from seizures. And we, you know, when a tiger is found in a snare, when, a, when um, tiger and other wildlife parts are found in freezers and villages or confiscated at borders. And that's where a lot of our information comes from. And these seizures are often considered uh, big successes, lots of news surrounding them. And indeed they are successes, but the tiger's already been killed. And so the key to stopping the impact of poaching on tiger populations is preventing poaching in the first place. And this is gonna, uh, this means stopping poaching on the ground through law enforcement intervention and demand reduction um, by changing human behavior. And so we're gonna focus on these two different strategies today. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Sri H.B. Girisha from the Indian Foreign Services. He's been designated as the Joint Director of the Wildlife Crime Bureau um, and has represented the Wildlife Crime Bureau as an expert in various forums such as Interpol, UNODC, and so on. Second, we have Merwin Fernandez, who's coordinator for Traffic India. A decade of experience in, he has a, a decade of experience in conservation policy and strengthening capacities of wildlife enforcement institutes and agencies. Third, we have Uttara, Uttara Men, Mendirata. Uttara leads the counter wildlife trafficking program for the Wildlife Conservation Society in India. She's got about two decades of experience working in anti-poaching and wildlife trade related issues. And finally, we have Diogo Verissimo with the Oxford Martin School who focuses on design and evaluation of behavior change interventions to influence consumers of wildlife products. Okay, so we'll jump into our first round of questions. Um, I wanna remind our panelists Please try to keep your answers concise to, to five minutes or so um, per question. But um, I'd like to start with Merwin. So Merwin, given your experience looking at tiger trade data, both from within India and globally, what can you tell us about the, sever the severity and trends of the problem? For example, is tiger poaching declining um, in India and globally? Does it affect some populations more than others? What are the regional trends in poaching? And how confident are you that poaching statistics gathered from seizures reflect the true picture of, of tiger poaching on the ground? Good morning, good evening, and to all who have joined. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Tyler Dialogues and all the organizations uh, who have given me this platform to showcase the what and how we can contribute towards this enriching discussions on poaching and the way forward primarily to it. To answer this question, John, I'll just share my screen to look at it in the more global context. Is the screen visible to all? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this confirmation. Uh, so, as you rightly said, uh, seizure is the basic measure that we use to look at success or to see, look at effectiveness or the way we are addressing the issue of poaching. Uh, mindful of the fact that uh, 
there hasn't been any other metrics uh, that has been uh, closer enough to understand what is happening to this charismatic and wonderful species through the years. And hence seizure still is one of the basic metrics that we have used. Uh, in fact, all countries everywhere have used this metrics uh, to relatively showcase what and how it is being used. To look at trends, uh, this is one of the analysis that we've done earlier from traffic, and this is a 2019 report. If you look through it, uh, most of this data, primarily there are three metrics which I'm putting out here. One is the tiger seizures, one is tiger seizures in range countries, and one is tiger uh, seizures which have occurred outside tiger range countries. What we see through the years that the consistency in reporting of these metrics has been increasingly being used to look at it. The other aspects of it, if you look through it, uh, from the entire uh, summation of 18 years, is that on a very conservative estimate, if you look at it, nearly 2,359 tigers, um, you can say have uh, uh, numbers of tigers uh, have been killed through these years. Uh, the number of countries that it, uh, where these metrics has been reported from is around 32 countries. So when I say 32 countries, it means there are more than 30, there are only 13 tiger range countries out of which eight of them are having tiger breeding populations. So we know now that uh, either these seizures have occurred in some of these countries which not have uh, known tiger breeding populations, which have contributed to this. This, this number of uh, 2,300 odd tigers is primarily a conservative estimate of uh, using basic uh, anatomical measures to come to and arrive to a number. Majority of this metrics, if you look at it, is 95% uh, uh, has been reported from tiger range countries. What is also to be known is that India does have a large stake into this. And this largest stake of India is primarily because it has got uh, more than 50, 60% of odd tigers, wild tigers that we know. And hence, it is quite highly represented in this format. What does it mean in terms of uh, tigers and how, how much of it is its respect to the global population? If we juxtapose this uh, number to, to a metric uh, of population with respect to 2016 itself, the uh, global tiger population, then this accounts for nearly five 0.5% of uh, the population, of the global tiger population. It's not a country-based matrix. If we look at this, uh, the global context, and we juxtapose India into this matrix, uh, it nearly follows the similar trend in India. Through the years, what we've seen in India is like, because of better reporting metrics and uh, into it, uh, this graph has been seen as stabilization uh, to a certain level. Uh, though this report is uh, from the 2018 metrics uh, uh, data sets, there are data sets which have come in and we are still analyzing these data sets uh, till the recent times. And this report will come out very soon from traffic. And uh, I think so. I've, um, is it okay with respect to the global context if I have missed any other query? No, I, I think you've got it, Yogo. Okay, so this is with respect to populations and trends. And let's go to the second slide. I've only got three slides. Where is this happening and what is this happening? Again, this is cumulatively done with all the seizure metrics across uh, uh, this great range period of two, from 2000 to 2018. Uh, some are collated across habitats, that's why it's DH, and some are co uh, collated against urban centers where tigers technically are not present, but seizures are occurring in these areas. So do we say that these uh, areas are highly prone? Primarily these are areas when we know and urban centers, it's primarily basically to transfer this good or this illicit product outside or to a market which is available uh, in its vicinity, any one of these factors. Uh, as rightly uh, introduced in the starting, there are multiple derivatives that have been uh, there from the tiger's point of view. Uh, if we look at it globally again, uh, though the large proportion comes from India, because it is rightly so that we see not only with tigers, but with many, many other species where 
the large number of populations is from uh, where the large number of population is recorded or so it's reported from technically reports the maximum number of seizures in that area and this is an indication also of showing how well uh, the law enforcement agencies have worked or even the government policies have form been formulated uh, to tackle or to handle this problem and this issue and yeah more to this we can allude later if uh, it's there to whatever uh, the next question or whatever but if you look at it, skins is one of the most easiest metric, which is, is one of the most easiest derivative that has been uh, or can be easily identified across all sections. That's why it has been seizures. But you have other body parts like the bones, uh, the claws, whiskers, and all these uh, other derivatives which come out from a post tiger. And these all are being useful to identify uh, not only the species, but also to then take cognizance of uh, a serious offense of poaching of an adult tiger. Thanks, John, for this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I'll, with the, yeah. I'm sorry. And I'll stop. And I'll stop sharing my screen because I think. So okay, I've, great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that was a really nice summary. Um, and it's interesting to to note how, you know, the the most seizures in India, but that also seems to some degree in proportion with. The, the proportion of tiger of the global population in India, whereas it struck me that certain countries like Thailand, for example, um, still within tiger range, had seizures that appear to be disproportionate, much greater than their proportion of the tiger population. Does that suggest that maybe skins are being moved from other places through those countries? Yeah. So. There are two inferences to this. One is either the, the derivative has reached that country from a known tiger range country, or it could have come from uh, something that we uh, call as captive tigers, which have been bred from these areas. And both these things need to be addressed and needs to be taken into cognizance, especially in some of the countries which do not have uh, viable breeding populations of tigers or whose populations are quite deep operated and with the species. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, well, with that summary, um, we've, and we've seen that, that India is a leader in at least seizures of tiger parts. So I'd like to go on to Garisha um, to talk about a little bit about tiger protection in India. Um, so India has a very strong history and, and tradition of protecting tigers. It supports approximately 70% of the global tiger population and has had many successful site-based recovery efforts um, across India. Um, however, I'd like to ask, does the poaching of tigers remain a significant issue for India um, throughout the last few decades, especially you know, considering the disappearance of tigers from Sariska, uh, from Pana, what kind of structural changes in government and management, including the establishment, for example, of the Wildlife Crime Bureau, um, what kind of changes ha have, has hap have happened in India and how do these changes contribute to tackling the international wildlife trade of tigers? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Oh, thank That's you. You're good. Yeah, good. So there are two basic questions here, um, uh, Mr. John has uh, like posed here. So one is about uh, the poaching. Uh, is it still uh, on, uh, and it's still a significant issue in India? And second is about uh, the structural changes uh, that have been brought in India, uh, as far as governance and management of the wildlife. Uh, and wildlife issues concerned in India. Of course, I do agree that poaching is still uh, is a significant issue in India. So we cannot deny. I would like to uh, start my uh, you know, presentation with this uh, quote by the Justice Markande Karju when he was you know like you know, rejecting the bail plea of uh, the uh, kingpin of the syndicate, uh, Mr. You know, Sansar Chand. So he told him that you know population of tigers and leopards uh, was declining, declining 
only because you are trading the skins and uh, skins of tigers and leopards so there is no tiger left in sarista because you know uh, just to you know your appetite appetite is so uh, high that you know for more and more money and he also said you know tomorrow you may even uh, sell the human skins so that was the sensitivity of for the uh, justice card rule and uh, the judgment is not uh, very old it is still contemporary so that's why i uh, i would like to say that you know poaching is still uh, a significant issue in india so here it is very pertinent to mention that you know while doubling the tigers populations we have forgotten that you know we are doubling our problems as well because uh, with increasing population uh, you know uh, the needs are also increased so here uh, you know the tiger and the human being uh, we are you know like you know sharing the space uh, uh, with each other and now issue is you know altogether different it is at a different level so now the issue is not just only the poaching the issue is like you know uh, the larger issue is that you know uh, uh, the skillful coexistence so uh, poaching of course is uh, is an issue in india because a lot many uh, hunting reports have been seen all across the nation whether it is due to accidental snaring uh, of the big cats or due to poisoning or due to electrocution so uh, in one or the other way of course uh, the poaching is being reported from all over india so about the structural change in the governance and the management uh, um, of the wild population per se and especially the tiger uh, in india of course it has added a significant value in uh, reduction of illegal wildlife trade especially with respect to tiger uh, this is visible this is visible in the sense the tiger population which was dwindling in india uh, or to the tune of around uh, 1200 1400 now it is doubled like you know to be how the highest population as john uh, said uh, in the question that uh, you know we have 70% of the wild population in india so here uh, i would like to uh, uh, appreciate the recommendation of uh, the uh, subramanian committee dr subramanian was a very senior ips officer and uh, two decades back uh, two and a half decades back the committee was set up under its uh, chairmanship and the committee uh, was constituted to uh, just to observe uh, and direct, give recommendation to prevent the illegal uh, trade in wildlife and wildlife products uh the committee of course came with a um, very strong uh, observations that you know the wildlife poaching and illegal wildlife trade in india is on uh, you know it's raising its head because uh, uh, in an organized man so that is important in an organized way and they have pointed out the reason as well because you know we uh, were lacking the uh, well structured enforcement machinery and uh, we were also lacking the systematic flow of uh, uh, information uh, for all law enforcement agencies so with those recommendations and you know then then the uh, hard process started how to improve the structure of enforcement in india uh, and you know how to bring in changes in the uh, governance of this protected area in india so they actually a uh, lot of efforts were were made in 97 uh, proposal was uh, put up by mh which was turned down and in 98 of course we, we came out with a uh a, a, a sort of a small bureau in amoria but in 2000 which is the turning point where there were major seizures in india one in ghaziabad in 99 and one in khaga in 2000 so that actually made triggered uh, uh, the uh, thought process to have a well structured uh, mechanism uh, you know uh, institutions for law enforcement in india so in 2001 uh, there was a wildlife crime cell uh, which was created in india under uh, uh, moea Uh, but yes 2004 as john rightly ma- uh, mentioned w- was the alarm call wherein the circus uh, risk was declared devoid of uh, tigers so here uh, tiger task force was established in 2005 which gave a strong recommendation that we should now have a bureau kind of set up and which is we should have a regional setups also to like strengthen the enforcement at uh, state uh, state levels uh, and to investigate all the international linkages and to break the chain of uh, larger syndicates and the poachers so here um, uh, an amendment serious amendment was brought in in the wildlife protection act and three important uh, bodies were created uh, the first one is uh, the, the uh, cza uh, the zoo authority and uh, ntca the tiger conservation authority and the wildlife crime control bureau so all the uh, three um, uh, these bodies uh, together have contributed a lot in uh, controlling the illegal wildlife 
to it and to bring in a systematic structure, uh, uh, both in scientific way as well as in uh, enforcement. So uh, WCCB, of course, is a multidisciplinary body, uh, which is having, you know, forest police and uh, custom officials at the supervisory level. And uh, we have got uh, uh, almost a representation from all uh, uh, CAPF uh, uh, at the cutting edge level, inspector and uh, uh, constables. So here, uh, the cross-cutting issues like, you know, information sharing mechanism about the criminal syndicates with the law enforcement agencies, sharing actionable inputs uh, with them and ensuring successful joint operations and giving investigation assistance to state uh, uh, law enforcement agencies. So all these were uh, pursued very rigorously by WCC. So uh, if you look at the functioning of the state uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, the protection and conservation has been the major agenda of uh, the Forest and Wildlife Department. But law enforcement, I mean, the enforcement has never been the major agenda. So infusion of these enforcement skills have resulted in uh, ensuring wildlife criminals to be put behind the boss for longer time, especially in the last one, one and a half decades. So that has made a great impact in reduction of the illegal wildlife trade in the organized sector. So although, uh, like, you know, increased detections have been found here because they are mostly influenced by the social media, like, you know, they get tempted to earn money. They are lured by the offers, uh, you know, uh, offered by the social media platforms. So that is all, you know, how this you know, reduction in the illegal wildlife trade, especially the, uh, the, the for the tiger job body parts. So there is a lot of change in the uh, management strategies as well. Uh, there is a great shift from uh, tiger-centric management opposed to landscape-oriented uh, interventions. So that has brought in a larger uh, impact. And the management issues were made very transparent. It became uh, no, APO-oriented. And uh, local-specific tiger conservation plans were prepared for all tiger reserves. And more and more tiger reserves have been identified. Now we have 50-plus tiger reserves in India. And the participate, ensuring the participation uh, of uh, civil societies is one more uh, uh, intervention that has added value in uh, reduction of this illegal wildlife trade. And uh, technology was given upper hand uh, and decision uh, support system was brought in. So like this, you know, a lot many changes were brought in uh, in the governance. The one major impact of reduction of this uh, illegal wildlife trade and poaching of tigers, which has enhanced the number of uh, tigers in India is creation of uh, uh, special tiger protection forces in all uh, tiger reserves. So somewhere we have even the army officials uh, working for us, retired army officials. Yeah. So I would like to conclude uh, by saying that, you know, the, now the governance is a perfect blend of uh, conservation strategies and enforcement strategies, enforcement strategies both uh, in tiger reserves uh, in particular and all across the nation in general. So which has brought in, uh, which has brought uh, this illegal uh, uh, trade uh, in uh, wildlife and wildlife contraband to a larger extent. So that is all I think I just wanted to you know, submit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gurishi. Um, you know, it really strikes me that, you know, to, to put this into a, an international context, it really strikes me um, the vast resources and the, the, the long period of time that India has worked on tiger conservation, you know, starting in the in the 1970s with Project Tiger, um, and how long that's taken to develop, um, but also how it, it's a great example of how important it is um, to have such strong government support and such uh, um, tremendous resources put into tiger conservation for it to be successful. And I think that that's an important lesson, especially for Southeast Asian countries where the poaching problem is so severe and tigers aren't doing very well. Um, we need to understand, it helps us to understand the amount of resources that really need to go into it and the length of time it can really take to develop these programs. Um, okay, with that, I'd like to go on to Uttara and I've, I've got two questions for you really. So you've got this very diverse experience um, over the past couple of decades of supporting enforcement agencies in, in anti-poaching efforts, dealing with wildlife trade, and often assisting often assisting them as, as an analyst. Um, so I want to know, have you witnessed trends in tiger 
poaching, in the methods used to poach, in the methods to, to feed the wildlife trade or conceal um, traffic tiger parts over the year. So for example, maybe um, the changes in, in the, the proportion of direct poaching versus the impact of retaliatory, retaliatory killing and incidental killing. Um, and then my second question, and I'll repeat this later if, if you need me to, but um, so also throughout your work, you have provided significant analytical insights into the nature of poaching, trade, and trafficking. Um, do you believe that we're maximizing the potential of our data, data in order to help address problems on site, um, country and regional levels? You know, for example, we have all, all this smart data and, and M, M stripes data coming in from poaching patrol teams. Is that being utilized to its full potential? Um, Yes, thank you. Thanks, John. Well, I'll start by thanking everybody involved in organizing this, and it's a privilege to be a part of this uh, panel. So, yes, I think absolutely things have changed uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, when I entered this field, Sansar Chand was still operating his business, sitting in you know, Sadar Bazaar, Delhi, and it looked very different there. Like, you know, uh, Girisha sir said, there was, you know, large... Uh, seizures in uh, Kaga and in uh, Ghaziabad and then in Sangsang. And these are seizures of large numbers. And we're talking about hundreds of skins, including tigers, leopards, otters. And uh, these consignments were going from uh, India in you know across borders. Uh, that is simply not possible now. It's even hard to imagine that that was a situation. And uh, right now, the capacity of our law enforcement agencies to investigate and to prosecute syndicated networks like the one that Sansachan operated are much higher. And uh, this kind of trade is certainly not what's happening at the moment. And this has changed uh, over the time, but uh, also what has changed are the markets. Uh, 20 years ago, we had the big expose of the fur markets in Tibet, and uh, those markets died out. And, you know, when Diego is talking about markets, we talk about what the different strategies. And I think that the Lai Lama's appeal to the Tibetan community to not wear fur or trade fur has gone, uh, had, had a huge impact. But uh, the markets are anyway extremely dynamic, and you'll see bones and uh, skins and claws and even products from bones, you know, it's plaster or wine, all this keeps changing and trending. And uh, the fur markets have, you know, been started more carefully, the bones, but we're still trying to figure out the claws market. This is both domestic and international. And there's meat market. I mean, there's even that, you know, you have banquets with tigers being eaten. And of course, also in the last 20 years, we have seen a huge uh, uprise in the farming, the captive farming of tigers in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and I mean, uh, in East Asia. And of course, like uh, Mr. Girisha said, the internet has come in and created a new marketplace and for tigers. But yes, a lot has changed. And at the moment, I think uh, what we're really dealing with is, yes, the amount of tigers, wild tigers going into international markets might have come down, but that doesn't mean we're not losing tigers. I think there's a lot of tiger deaths in traps that is happening across, you know, there are electric traps, there are snares, which are put out for uh, bushmeat hunting, and a lot of our tigers and leopards are dying there. And it's not to say that has nothing to trade to do with trade because the claws will go missing. And we know these claws get, uh, you know, put into jewelry of pendants or even the whole paw will go missing, which is, you know, kind of indicates it's uh, use in black magic. Um, so yes, I think a lot has changed and uh, both in terms of the, you know, the supply, the demand and the enforcement side of it. Uh, coming to your second question, and I would say, yes, absolutely. We have not yet maximized our use of the current data. And I would even say there's still a lot of data which hasn't been identified yet and acknowledged as data that would be useful. And I'll just kind of quickly go over some of the data sources that we typically have. I think a lot of our how question, how the trade operates, how it is, uh, you know, uh, the modus operandi, how it's, uh, you know, what are the hotspots, where are the destinations, still comes from investigations. Good investigations will give us that data. But uh, I don't think we have fully been able to kind of analyze that data well. It is much better managed. It is much better coordinated between agencies. But I think there's still scope to, you know, analyze that data better. 
And like you mentioned, there's much better, you know, patrolling data. And this is really important for the where and, you know, when of a local situation. You know, if you know your PA, when it's happening, where it happens, it really helps the agencies to focus on, uh, you know, certain areas, certain times. And that's really helpful, especially given how low our resources are in terms of what we have in terms of effort and money we can spend. So I think there is a lot of data potentially coming from m from SMART, that can give us a lot of, uh, you know, uh, help with the when and where questions. And I hope more and more we will be using that. Seizure, seizure data like Marvin, uh, you know, talked about is really great for our what, you know, again, that tells us its bones, skins, claws, what's really happening. I, I think the, you know, we can't entirely rely on it on terms of marking hotspots and routes. We do do it because that's sometimes the best data, but surely that saves a lot. I mean, the seizures are more about the enforcement, how much enforcement is happening. And a lot of trade hotspots are missed just because there's no enforcement there. But yes, I think that really is very, I mean, the what certainly gets answered there. I think the trickier question when it comes to, uh, you know, illegal wildlife trade is the why, because uh, that often brings in, you know, human behavior motivations, which are not so straightforward, but I'm really excited that there are more and more, you know, social science tools which are coming in and we are able to ask these questions and also kind of plug them back into the, you know, initiatives and the, you know, responses that we are trying to create. But even beyond this, why, how, and what questions are larger questions about, you know, how do our response fare? And I think an uh, example I like to use is the, you know, the role of the legal system. I know we are doing something called the legal gap analysis, trying to understand why cases fail or succeed in courts. There's also others who are looking at conviction rates. And this is really important data because what it tells us is after the whole effort of detecting, seizing, arresting, prosecuting, how many times are they actually getting punished? And the punishment as a deterrence is really important to understand because we're investing so much in it. And I think the deterrence theory says that punishment surely has to come through certainly, and it has to be perceived as being severe and it has to be swift. I'm not sure if we have achieved that. So, you know, it kind of helps us think back about our responses and how we're faring on that. So I think there's a lot of data out there and which can give us a really good, uh, you know, insights into what are the larger uh, questions, what are the nuances and how are responses to them fair? So I, I hope I covered your thing. I know I've been talking for five minutes, but I hope I covered everything you asked. Yes, thank you, Dora. That was a, a, a an excellent answer. Um, you know, and in my experience in, in tiger conservation, we've uh, supported anti-poaching teams for, for so many years. And I can't you know, I, I agree with you so much how important punishment is. And it's so demoralizing for an anti-poaching team when they go through all the trouble of arresting somebody in the forest, bringing them in. Um, and, you know, to them, that's that's the holy grail. That's their big success. And then a week later, that person is free and, and you know, never convicted, never punished. Um, and it, you know, it just destroys their morale. So that that is absolutely critical. Um, okay, I'd like to move on to Diogo and talk a little bit about demand reduction, which is a field that I really have no experience in. So um, I'm really interested to, to learn more about what you're doing. Um, so demand reduction campaigns are often viewed as a sort of a one-off single education awareness raising advertising style intervention designed to appeal to consumer conscience and encourage the, the reduction or elimination of, of animal products in trade or, or in their use. Um, but what are the nuances involved in, in demand reduction interventions and what's required to, to design such interventions? Thank you very much, John, for, for that question. I want to start to, um, by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's really uh, exciting to have the chance to uh, speak today to, to all of you. Um, just to answer your question, I'm going to focus on three different areas. You know, there's lots that could be said about how, how you design um, a demand reduction intervention. I'll, I'll, I'll be dropping some links uh, in the chat uh, if anyone wants more details, for some some papers and things we, uh, we've written on the, on the topic. But really, you know, I want to emphasize on 
three things. First one is this idea of having a clear audience. Uh, sometimes there's this idea that, oh, we want to reach everyone, we want to reach the general public. But actually what happens if, if you don't have a clear defined audience is that really you cannot tailor your message. You cannot um, make sure that you're choosing the channels for communicating that are the most appropriate, that the audience finds the most trustworthy. And that's really going to impact your probability of having success. So I would say one really important nuance of demand reduction is this idea of clearly defining who it is you want to reach, who it is that you want to change, and this realization that, um, you know, speaking to everyone is speaking to no one at all. Um, so the second one is this idea of the importance of planning. You know, very often we think about uh, very much, you know, very much to the exact question you posed, you know, we think about demand reduction as, oh, just another education activity, oh, just another, you know, set of posters we need to put out or uh, Facebook posts or whatever it might be. Um, but actually, if you really want to ensure that we have maximum probability of success, we need to have a full planning process that's really not much different from the, 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 the processes we follow from many of the other activities that conservation uh, is involved in. If you think about the open standards, for example, if you think about some of the planning processes that go on, we need the same things. We need a theory of change. We need clear indicators. We need clear understanding of how the activities map on to the outcomes we want to achieve, what the, how the outputs we want to produce relate um, to the outcomes and ultimately the impact, right? It's really important to have a good sense of uh, a clear sort of set out, planned out uh, intervention. V again, very much to the same um, standards we would have for anything else that we do, right, uh, in, in conservation. So those are really, I think, two, two important things. And the third one is this idea of um, having a strategy uh, for measuring uh, impact and having that impact be a behavioral impact, right? So very often, what happens is, you know, impact evaluation is relegated for a, you know, as a as an add on to a project. You know, oh, if we have budget, we'll measure, we do evaluation. Oh, if, you know, if there's a problem with the budget, uh, we'll cut the evaluation. It's not a problem. Um, but I think. You know, that puts us in a situation where I think all of us want to have some sense of whether we're making a difference. Um, and sometimes what happens is organizations end up, you know, claiming successes without having the evidence for it. And I feel like that's a little bit like, you know, wanting to have your cake uh, and eat it at the same time, right? So if there's no impact evaluation strategy, um, then we can't really talk about whether you know there's been a success or, or not. And that, that's really fundamental for, for behavior change, for demand reduction interventions, because understanding whether an, uh, an intervention has succeeded or not is really, um, it, it's really fundamental in terms of learning, in terms of understanding how we should be doing things next time. Um, and uh, sort of in the neighborhood of this last, this last issue uh, of around impact measurement and, and the strategy behind it, I think there's a couple of things Oh, I guess I'll highlight two two things that are pervasive. I think when I have discussions about this with with colleagues, I mean the first one is this this idea that um, or is is the, the being comfortable with the fact that when it comes to changing behavior, success is most often a small change. Right? Very often, you know, we see proposals for uh, you know behavior change uh, interventions that. Um, have as, as their targets uh, changes of 50%, 40%. Um, and those changes in, 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 in a couple of years are, are usually not, not, not realistic. That's not realistically what we can achieve. If you look at fields like public health, for example, that have been doing this a lot longer than we have, uh, we know that success is probably going to be a 5% change. 3% change, 7% change. That's what realistic success in a couple of years is going to look like. Um, and so we need to become comfortable with the fact that, yes, if it was easy, it would have changed a long time ago. We would have achieved it already. It's hard. And so a small change is it's perfectly fine to define success as you know, a small change as long as we can you know, measure it and we can learn from it and improve it. Um, the, the second thing is this idea that... Um, the worst case scenario when it comes to behavior change interventions, demand reduction, is that the intervention has no effect. Um, actually, that's that's not the case. The worst case scenario is that it makes things worse, right? Is that it works exactly as opposite as you we would have intended. Um, and you know, of course, none of us want to be in that position. All of us want to believe that everything we do um, makes things a little bit better. But in, you know, if you look at again public health, they have a much bigger literature than we do. It's not uncommon for things to go wrong you know human behavior is really complex all of us exist in 
complex systems with lots of moving parts. Sometimes you tweak things in one side and things go a little bit you know, differently than you expect. Um, and that's again why it's really crucial to have the evaluation, the measurement piece, um, for us to know what helps, what doesn't help, for us to avoid and learn as a community as well. So that those results need to be shared so that if I'm doing something and doesn't go very well, I can share with all of you and you can all avoid making the same mistake I did. So we can all move forward as a community. Because um, I, I think ideally really if we all want to conserve biodiversity that's how we should be working um so really those three things are the the, the three things the three sort of nuance aspects um that i would highlight um the one having a clear audience second really investing into planning and the third one um you know having a clear impact measurement strategy Thank you, Diogo. I'm I'm really happy to hear you talk about theory of change and and impact measurement. Um, and I can't stress how important that is. You know, if we are, you know, our, our our goal is to increase tiger numbers. That means reducing tiger mortality on the ground. And if we're not impacting that um, and not measuring that impact, then we're not doing the right thing. And you know, if you're if you're a, a a ranger on the ground and and stop a poacher just before he, he pulls the trigger it's really easy to see that impact but the further you get away from that act it becomes very difficult to measure impact um and uh, you know i imagine in in demand reduction that measuring impact is a is a really big challenge so so that's our first set of questions i've got one more set of questions um before we'll we'll open things up to the audience um, and Garish, I think I'll start with you. So, although the, the Wildlife Crime Bureau has been able to mobilize a variety of stakeholder groups within its short history, I want to ask, are there, are there still gaps in the functioning that must be filled and how might they improved, be improved? Um, are there any lessons that can be learned from this short history in, in setting up the, the WCCB um, as such a and it's such a high level agency? Um, are there any lessons for other Tiger Range countries? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are still gaps. Uh, you know, although we have been venturing into uh, you know, almost all facets of uh, these uh, uh, these uh, um, reduction strategies. Uh, demand reduction strategies as well as enforcement, uh, covering almost all enforcement agencies like you know, Uzova, Uzova is important. Uh, Uzova is having a stake in this uh, uh, field. So starting from uh, border guarding agencies, uh, the customs and uh, CAPF, uh, uh, central uh, you know, armed police forces, uh, and also the state law enforcement agencies. So, so, so almost all uh, due care uh, was taken to uh, build the capacities to sensitize them and involve them uh, in uh, controlling uh, the illegal wildlife trade. So a lot has been done, but still there are gaps. The gaps, I would say that, you know, um, uh, may not be in India, maybe world over, it is seen that, you know, the conservation policies are not in tandem with uh, the welfare policies. So uh, because uh, wherever you go uh, in any country, the basic community uh, that is used for poaching is the local hunting communities. So uh, they are uh, like, you know, the, the, the bargaining uh, builds on that, the, the poverty. So uh, most of the conservation policies um, world over are not linked with, uh, and they're not in tandem with uh, uh, the welfare policies. So uh, yes, uh, there are a lot more lessons to be taken from uh, the functioning of WCCB as I was mentioning earlier. So this is one of the uh, refined agency wherein uh, uh, the participation of, uh, uh, of all important uh, law enforcement agencies is ensured to be present in the supervisory level and also at the cutting edge level. And uh, that gives an advantage uh, over the simple organizations that, you know, because uh, around 70% of the workforce is uh, borrowed from the law enforcement agencies, they still have their connections with the uh, their own organizations. So it is not the one person that is uh, you know, who is coming into WCCB. It is the representation of the whole organization that is with the WCCB. 
So most of them are like, you know, from the intelligence wing of uh, the law enforcement agencies who are observed here on deputation. And uh, that adds strength. So unlike, uh, you know, the simple model of uh, uh, having uh, one agency, uh, like empowered with, you know, all sort of powers, technical powers, you know, interdiction powers, all sort of powers, one agency, but here, lot many agencies having all those powers with their parent organizations. So uh, WCCB as on date has emerged as, emerged as the finest intelligence agency. So, you know, if you like, you keep collecting information, collate all that information with the ground realities and share the actionable inputs with the law enforcement agencies and uh, do coordinate with you know, all of them for joint operations and you know, uh, take it to the logical end and you know, keep assisting uh, even the investigation and prosecution process as well. Uh, the finest provisions uh, that were, you know, that were infused in while creating this organization is the beauty of the mandate. So mandate doesn't restrict us, you know, be like involving the civil societies to partner with us, and that doesn't, you know, like uh, prohibit us in partnering with the students and you know the scholars or uh, with the, any of the law enforcement agencies in the country. So that sort of liberty and a huge mandate, although there's a huge mandate, but the liberty that we have. So that gives an edge to work, uh, that gives the liberty to work. So that is one lesson, of course, uh, I mean, uh, any uh, other uh, country can pick up from uh, WCCB creation. So here, uh, the officers, of course, are uh, very well trained um, in the beginning only so that then take up, they can take up all those tasks. So it is not uh, like, you know, all officers are out here are trained in all respects. So not that, you know, like everybody would be having uh, uh, knowledge of all sort of uh, uh, like uh, crime happening all around and uh, tackling skills and all that. Uh, so that is what uh, uh, you know. I just wanted to submit about you know what are the uh, you know, like you know, perfect lessons that can be taken up uh, by uh, WCCB because I always you know uh, tell everybody that it is in teenage, so uh, you know it is uh, still you know a growing baby. So we still have a very long way to go uh, and, you know, but nevertheless, uh, the uh, kind of exposure WCCB has got uh, the kind of presence, presence. So it has made all over the world. Uh, so that is significant. It's only because of the mandate and the liberty and the kind of functioning. So that is ensured uh, uh, for uh, WCCB. So that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Girish. As a As a biologist trying to understand law enforcement, I find the the complexities of it a little bit mind boggling and the success that you've had in the, the short time that WCCB has been in existence, um, nothing short of yeah, awe inspiring. Fun. So um, with that, I think I'd like to go on to Merwin. Um, and talk a little bit about uh, a little bit dig a little bit more deeply into to data and trends. So previously you talked about the data we have on hand to understand trends in wildlife trade. Um, do you think these data are capable of helping us keep the finger on the on the pulse for closely monitoring international wildlife trade, or do we need something else? Um, and also, how are captive bred farmed tigers contributing to the trade and how might that affect the poaching of wild populations? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, John, for this. Uh, so let's come to the trends part of it. So do we have what we know with respect to the trends? As I said, seizure is one way or one of the indicators uh, that gives us an indication of what is happening. As even Uttara rightly pointed out, key where it stands in terms of seizures. Uh, whether this, uh, we must also understand that all seizures which we undertake, it's not, it's not a complete set in its in its entirety. We know that only a portion of it may or may not be, uh, a portion of it gets detected and then gets reported. There may be other factors also that could come in uh, where we do not have a reporting system collated at the government level or at the senior most levels in the offices for various other countries. Uh, 
to actually pinpoint key whether we've captured all information in relevance uh, to what is happening to the animal. So seizure by itself, it is still working as an indicator, but can there be better other indicators? Uh, we've rightly pointed out key what's happening right at the site level. And we have a lot of programs which have been devised, a lot of monitoring tools that have been uh, come up and that set up uh, MSTRIPE has been one. Can this integrate together to then create a decision-making system where it could be monitored at a, at a faster space? Because what seizure tells you is like what happened to the end of it. It doesn't tell you what's happened throughout this thing. The second part with uh, uh, seizure data is that the tiger may have been poached or killed sometime, sometime back in, in, its, in its history. And that seizure may have happened uh, maybe down the line or timeline. And that is what is attributed to a seizure happening within that uh, day or month and that year. But that may not be the fact. In, uh, in fact, uh, you had asked me an earlier question, Ki, what are these issues and do we have it? So I, I'm saying like, if we can work with both these metrics as coming out from intensive monitoring, which uh, the governments have put forth, uh, systems such as M-Stripes, uh, and even the other systems which are there in some few countries, if that could be linked together uh, and provided information to field managers, I think so then we'll come up with a better metrics. The other part is like uh, the tigers being the apex predator and there is so much of know-how about tigers and so much of knowledge about tigers that seizure reports do get reported across uh, systems. Uh, but even uh, in some instances, they might be having a seizure which has been occurred uh, by a different organization, or in fact, a law enforcement agency who may not have identified this to be a tiger derivative itself. And that is one of the things that uh, requires still to be addressed. Uh, as we know that law enforcement agencies are not biologists trained, uh, and also sometimes those parts and products may have taken up a different format or a derivative may have taken up into a value added product, making it very difficult to understand. It is in this light uh, that certain advanced technologies can be looked at. Like uh, we've not talked about DNA based uh, technologies to identify. We see a large amount of uh, seizures of claws happening, especially in India. Uh, but we do not know whether this is all coming from a particular set of tigers from a particular region or it is coming from different other species. And this ambiguity needs to be settled sometime or the other. Uh, having said that, it's not only the mandate of one country, but having standard set of markers across countries, it's where this technology that will work very well. Uh, so that even if a seizure, uh, like you pointed out to me, like Thailand having so many number of seizures happening, despite not having a large population, if we have these markers standardized across, then we would actually point out that these markers uh, or this type or, or this derivative is actually coming out from an X population, from an X site in a particular region. Right now, not having this uh, high level coordination and cooperation across countries, it's some of a gap in terms of addressing this issue of poaching. It may not only be for tigers, it could be then used for multiple other species. And your second question was, what's happening? So as I said earlier, like we had uh, in the initial trend analysis of showing 32 uh, countries which reported tiger seizure, we know that third, eight countries have got tigers. Over there in uh, Thailand case, again, you've pointed out a large number. So where is this extra number of tigers coming? Are they, are they only coming from, uh, from outside tiger known countries or they're coming out from captive bred? There are cases which, uh, which are famously known where we see this as a, a spurt of tigers being brought in only from captive farms. And this is not only happening in the South Southeast Asian region. Uh, there are seizures which have occurred in Europe, in South Africa, or in the African continent and in the Americas. And this is a, a worrying trend. Until uh, this captive farm tigers are available, uh, the demand will still be met from either sources. And it will be the economics of play, which Daigo earlier alluded to, Ki, who is there out uh, wanting to make that uh, basic, uh, basic uh, 
life uh, of ease just by getting some additional money will then may or may move into uh, an illicit trade or an illegal trade yeah that's that's for my side john thanks thank you merwin um i think you, since you mentioned tiger farming, we've got a, a question from the audience that I'm going to jump to right now and open it up to, to the panel, anyone who would like to talk about it. Um, so uh, basically, it's why not farm tigers to, move, to meet the demand, like the way we farm um, chickens, for example? Um, why, why don't we just do that? And, and how, how would that impact tigers in the wild? Go ahead, Diogo. I, I see you. You unmuted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, well, I, I just wanted to um, give a, you know, perhaps not 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 super uh, interesting, but still, I think uh, honest, uh, you know, reply to, to to the question. I think it's really um, it's really one of those situations where um, there's there's quite a lot of complexity. It, it might seem that uh, a situation like that would be, you know, easily a, a solution to the problem, but there are of course many many different things to consider. Things like of course, the biology of the chicken and the tiger, um, which are not, not similar. You know, the fact that um, there are market dynamics um, that affect whether a, a farming operation is sustainable or not. Uh, the fact that we, um, uh, that, that, you know, trade is regulated in some places, but, but not others and regulation is different. So it's really, I think, quite a, um, um, a question that is a lot more complex than it seems, and uh, certainly there's been a long-standing debate in amongst researchers as whether farming can help in some instances and others. And there's um, some species like crocodiles, where um, like vicuña, where you know that uh, as has been the case, the form of farming has helped, but others that's really not been the case. Um, recently, there was a paper focusing on porcupines, for example, in Southeast Asia, where you know, that was not uh, really the case, and so. Um, I guess my answer, which is not perhaps not very helpful, but still, uh, is that um, it, this is a question that is a simple question that's a quite a complex answer, um, and one that um, and one that really depends a lot on context, on species, on the dynamics of a market at a particular time. Um, so there's really, I think, uh, it's really a, a, a difficult thing to 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 be able to answer with any type of certitude and then of course there's the you know risk right and uh, the uh, link to it but of course um so that's that's what i'll leave it i think leave it to uh, others as well to have their say yeah anybody else want to comment on that uh, john one thing to look at in terms of it is like oh, the why why do you want to farm it and whether it solves that larger issue in terms of the need for that part product or derivative from that species. And if it's really not solving that issue for what it is required, and that's the thing that needs to be then put out. Uh, so that is from your, uh, whether what would be the larger ramifications by, by maintaining this demand uh, within the market, uh, there is external pressures uh, of making quick value money. Uh, from wild tigers. And we know that the economics of play will come in, uh, in some times or the others, where the trickle down effect for making quick money is there. And that will have larger ramifications on wild tiger populations. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Speaking from my own experience, um, yeah, when, when I worked in, in Far Eastern Russia, doing work on tigers and leopards just across the border from northeastern China. A lot there were a lot of Chinese citizens illegally entering Russia to collect ginseng. Um, illegally entering Russia is a pretty dangerous thing to be to be doing. And so I asked people why, you know, why are they doing it? It's just ginseng. You can buy it in the store or anywhere. So because wild wild ginseng is so is worth so much more. Um, so these guys are are willing to risk their lives to, to collect wild ginseng. And I suspect the, the same thing would be true for tigers, but also for tigers, we've only got 4,500 tigers left in the wild um, and a huge demand for those tigers. Um, if there's any kind of poaching pressure on them, it's a big deal and a big problem. And it seems that tiger farming is 
promoting the use of tiger parts and is just going to promote the use of, of wild tigers. So John, just to add to that, there has at least been one study where they surveyed uh, consumers and they did say that they would prefer wild tigers because that'll be more potent. And I think we can't rule that out. And I know on the surface, it looks very intuitive. They breed well, let's have farms and it'll take care of everything. But like Diogo said, it's much more complicated and the market dynamic, especially the preference for wild is I think something we can't just uh, brush away. I think this is complex and needs a lot of thought. Yeah, thank you, Utra. Yeah, and you know, I'd also argue that tigers are a wild species. Most of the animals, certainly not by no means all of the animals, most of the animals that we're farming are domesticated species. Um, and they're adapted to living in, in captive situation, whereas tigers are not. And you have to question the ethics of that, I think. Um, okay, well, with that, I'm going to move on to my next question, <clears throat> and actually, Uttar, I'll, I'll go on to you, uh, since we uh, just mentioned ethics. So talking about ethics, there is obviously a lot of ethical and human rights related issues when it comes to law enforcement. Um, and I hesitate to even ask this because I'll, I'll be opening a can of worms and it's a huge subject that we could easily address with a, a different session and, and uh, uh, another um, group of panelists. but. Um, I think it's at least worth touching on in, in this session. So could you talk about some of these ethical issues and what safeguards are needed if we want to keep tigers alive in these complex landscapes that also support culturally and eco economically diverse residents? Yes, John, as you said, this is an extremely difficult kind of a conversation, but I think it's very clear that the there have been events, uh, very unfortunate that there have been events that, you know, where human rights violation and brutality have been linked with protection, and this is just clearly unacceptable. I, I can't think of anybody being able to justify that on any ground, so that's clearly unacceptable. And I'm really happy to see that more and more individuals, more and more organizations are being sensitive to this. I think they are you know, putting in place genuine safeguards that would stop this from happening, at least to a large extent. And generally, there's a more, you know, uh, it's pushed towards a socially just conservation in general and protection being a very central part of that. And like you said, I mean, it's a big, uh, you know, debate that we can talk about. There are lots of safeguards, there are lots of situations. But I think in this context, and since, since we were talking about this, I, I'll point out to one thing that I would really like to see and I think would really help is how we define the job. I think we very often, you know, we have kind of internalized this image of, a, you know, weapon yielding man in a uniform, uh, you know, as the central character of our protection. And yes, boots on the field are very, very critical and they have to be there, but that's only part of the job. I think we need to recognize that there is place for, you know, analysts, there's place for uh, problem solvers, there's place for even botanists and, you know, researchers in this. And, uh, you know, it's like, we, we see the James Bond, but we forget that he won't survive a day without master, you know, Q master. And I think if we redefine the job and we bring this in, there is gonna be a influx of individuals who will see this job differently, who would be willing to take on a new role. And I think that might be our one small step towards addressing some of this in addition to the safeguards and you know other things that almost every organization now really taking very seriously. So yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's just enforcement is seen as the entire picture when it's not. And I'll just use the situational crime prevention framework. And this is a framework that we use to understand responses or opportunities available to us in a certain situation. And enforcement response or increasing enforcement response is one out of 25 responses. It also includes, you know, extending guardianship. And this would extend to the community, the local residents who are in a place, you know, strengthening their capacity, strengthening their motivation to protect. I think those are highly unutilized or underutilized, you know, uh, aspects of protection that we haven't recognized. And I think we need to do that if we want to move away from this militarization and, you know, uh, way of doing protection. Yeah, thanks, Uttara. It's, yeah, I mean, wildlife crime is, is uh, 
incredibly complex problem and requires incredibly complex solutions that but yeah i think hollywood and bollywood have have uh made us think only about those boots on the ground law enforcement because that's where the excitement is right um okay i think diogo i'd like to to go on to you and go back to these um complex issues of, of demand reduction com campaigns and what we talked about earlier. Um, and could you talk a little bit more about two, two aspects? One, measuring the effectiveness uh, of, of your interventions. And, you know, we, we mentioned how difficult that is to show that you're having an impact. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you do that? Um, and tying it into to what we just talked about, what are the ethical issues surrounding implementing demand reduction campaigns? So two kind of very different questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You might yes, actually um, start with the second one since we were just talking about ethics. Yeah, sure, that sounds good. So ethic, you know, in terms of ethics, that certainly um, any any behavior change intervention and demand reduction, reduction is not, not no different, um, needs to have a strong, um, you know, ethics sort of, you know, process behind it. So one, one aspect that's really important is this idea of uh, co-designing any intervention with your target audience, right? So if there's a group of people that you want to influence, get them involved in uh, defining what the intervention should be, um, how it should be applied, you know, get their, their input, get them to be part of the process. There's a um, uh, co-design process that is used in fields like social marketing, for example, um, that's been tried and, and tested. And that's something we're um, definitely bringing into the, the wildlife trade space now. Um, for example, recently with some work uh, with some uh, uh, colleagues here uh, in Oxford on bear bile in China, we worked with uh, doctors, with pharmacists, with bear bile users um, to uh, understand what are the different interventions we could put in place um, to reduce um, uh, demand for illegal illegal bear bile in, in China, right? So that's really, I think, a strong foundation for, um, for uh, having an ethical intervention. Because of course, uh, particularly, you know, someone in my position uh, is, I think, in a particular sensitive, uh, uh, you know, place because I am uh, an outsider in most places that I work in. I am not just from outside of the community, but from outside the country. Um, and so that means that really, um, there's no reason why I should um, I should be uh, uh, telling people what to do or not to do um, in these different places, right? So it's really important that it is really um, led by local actors um, and, and, and co-designed with the target audience with me just being a, a, in a more a technical uh, facilitator, right, um, in, 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 that, in that process. So that's, that's one aspect that I would say. Uh, of course, there are other, 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 you know, key guidelines, of course, like, for example, um, we cannot uh, promote changes in behavior that go against the welfare uh, and the well-being of the of the target audience, which of course is as, is more complicated than it sounds, uh, because well-being is not a very easy thing to uh, to measure and to uh, and to put bounds around. Um, but but certainly, you know, those those are the types of things that, well, of course, we have to think about. There's some guidelines out there. So, for example, the International Social Marketing Association has uh, uh, ethics working groups that I have uh, had the pleasure to be involved in, who's produced recently a set of guidelines. They're out for consultation now, or exactly on the different uh, dimensions of ethics when planning a, a behavior change intervention. I'll, I'll put the link on the chat so that if anyone's interested, they could have a look. Um, these you know, are across a number of dimensions of things that need to be considered uh, when you're thinking about designing any kind of behavior change intervention. And of course, again, I want to highlight the fact that well, this is a nascent field when it comes to uh, biodiversity conservation in many ways. There are other fields out there that have done this for a long time. And so they, you can draw from their experience, right? Um, and I, I'm going to use that sort of uh, aspect to segue into the impact evaluation, right? So, you know, John, very, very rightly, you said th there are immense, there are tremendous challenges when it comes to measuring impacts of demand reduction. Now, that does not mean in, by any stretch of the imagination that it's not, it's not possible. Uh, that we, uh, um, you know, should be, uh, should give up on it. Um, we certainly can measure, but it does mean, of course, that we need to bring to that challenge the 
rigorous sort of social science practices. It does mean that we need to bring to the table resources, right? So again, this issue of evaluation being a crucial part of the process uh, of, of implementing a project and not an add-on, not an optional bit you can do at the end, right? Um, so if that's the case, then certainly I think we, we can correspond, we can match that challenge. We've had uh, several uh, interventions I've, 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 I've focused on, uh, some work in, in, in Singapore with Saiga Horn, some work in West Africa with sea turtles, for example, where we've carried out uh, you know, evaluations. And of course, you know, uh, recognizing that we live in a world that's fastly, you know, fast evolves, uh, human behavior is challenging to measure even the best of, of conditions, right? So there's a there's noise in the system, there's error we have to fight against. But there's also, you know, a lot of knowledge that we can draw from international development, from public health, right, which have similar challenges to ones, the ones we have, and they manage to measure their outcomes and impacts very effectively, right? So it's not really uh, I would argue very strongly that there's there's really no barrier, technically speaking, to measure um, the impact of demand reduction interventions. There might be a, a will, a lack of will uh, to commit the resources, a lack of will to invest the time, right, which is a separate issue, um, certainly. Um, but so you know, I, I guess um, I, I guess I, I would just end with maybe uh, adding one last concept to the mix that I'd like to um, not not finished without mentioning, which is this idea of the counterfactual, right? So very often we rely on quite simplistic, you know, ways of measuring change, for example, just measuring before and after, right? Start doing two surveys, one before and one after, right? And I really want to emphasize this idea of the counterfactual, which is, you know, thinking about what would the world look like if there had been no, in, no campaign, no project, no intervention, right? And for that, we really need to have some sort of control group, some sort of comparison that we can compare our world currently as it stands with what would, it would have looked like otherwise, right? Um, and this you know, can be done in a, in a variety of different ways. I'm you know, again, happy to add some, uh, some links on the, uh, in the chat if anyone's interested in looking forward, uh, you know, looking a bit more in detail, but I really wanna emphasize that this idea of having comparing what we can measure with another group that is not affected by our program, by our project, by our uh, uh, intervention is really a crucial thing. Um, and that, that allows us to go a little bit further in not just saying change occurred, but saying change occurred and it was because of this intervention, right? Which is really a critical step. I mean, sometimes we, you know, we take shortcuts and we, uh, you know, we just sort of, you know, cross our fingers and really, 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 really hope that it was our intervention that caused that change. But without that ability to compare um, to a control group, to a comparison group, um, it's really just uh, our our hopes and dreams, really. We won't be able to have the evidence say it for us. Um, and that's, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, that, that's where I'll, where I'll end. Okay, thank you, Diogo. I, you know, in, in my history of conservation experience, one of the, the trends that I've seen is that donors, who, whom we are all very dependent on, um, are more and more expecting us to demonstrate our impact. Um, and that's a good thing, holding our feet to the fire. Um, but the, the thing that I is happening more slowly is donors understanding how difficult and expensive a process that is. And so they say you want, you know, a donor tells you that they want to um, want you to measure impact and you come back and say, well, that's going to cost $50,000 of this grant that you're giving me. All of a sudden it becomes a little bit of a different story, but, and, and so I think donors need to really catch up with, with that demand and, and put that extra money up um, because we can't do the conservation interventions and measure the impact from that same pot of money. So, um, Okay, I'm going to jump to some questions from the audience. I think we, we've really only got about six minutes left. Um, so I think I'll, I'll so I'll throw this out to the the panel. Um, the question is: Are we catching more low-level poachers than kingpins? Um, maybe even outside of tiger range countries. Um, but how how important is that? How important is it to to catch the kingpins? Um, and what you know? How can we be more effective in in disrupting syndicates? I guess.
Anybody want to jump in on that one? I just wanted to pick that question. Anyway, you read it. Thank you very much for that. So this is really a, a matter of serious concern, and these things have been done. So that is how you know the tiger population in the wild has been increased. So uh, I just wanted to emphasize the concept called preventive intelligence. The understanding the so social fabrication of the landscape is very very important when you want to address the problems of that uh, landscape. See, if you like, you know, consider India. So not that all hunting communities are after the tigers. So there are very specific, you know, hunting communities who are experts in in poaching tigers, and there are not many, right? So that's why I say the the, the success of any uh, intelligence agency or an enforcement agency lies in uh, developing art and skill of uh, uh, preventive intelligence, for which you know understanding for social fabrication is very very important. So here, um, uh, you must be interested in knowing that you know kingpins are to be right definitely. So here, you know, disrupting the links is very important, whether it is at the highest level or at the lowest level or anywhere. See, when uh, the sequence is disturbed, of course, the trade is going to hamper, right? So that is the aim of any law enforcement agency in any sort of uh, you know uh, illegal trade. So they simply keep on disturbing the channel, you know, the chain, because it's difficult to track. The entire entire syndicate in one go, so you know we keep simply adding uh, the information to the earlier networks uh, or, you know, or through the analysis. So here uh, it takes time to understand who is who is actually the kingpin and to locate uh, you know exactly where he's based. And now it has become more challenging uh, in the virtual world, and you know because um, through VPNs and and all those facilities. So difficult to find out a person from where he is operating and all, and that has added a challenge to us. So in the, in the legal uh, world of trade and virtual market, so definitely the job is on uh, in uh, handling these kingpins. And uh, yes, it is not so easy job. So it took almost it took almost a decade for us to locate you know these kingpins, and the last one to uh, get arrested is the Lambu Fariyat from uh, the Tarai uh, area uh, landscape of India. Who actually had been a watcher? I mean, the daily wage laborer in the forest department. The world as a international, uh, uh, you know, part of international syndicate. So it takes time actually uh, to locate, you know, the, the kingpins of the syndicate. So definitely, law enforcement agencies are on the job, and uh, and you know, uh, each one will be taken to task. Thank you. Thank you, Gurush. Anybody else want to comment on that from the panel? I've just realized I can't see you for some reason when you raise your hand. So if, if you if you do have something to say, please just speak up. No, okay. I we've got a couple minutes left, so so let's try to to tackle one more question from the audience. Um, and this one is again regarding data. Do we have enough resolution in our data? to tell the difference between and uh, the difference between incidental captures um, from other activities and motivated poaching um, or, or direct poaching of tigers. Do we have a, do we have a, a good understanding of these da data enough to understand the difference in the motivations? Uh, I'll take that, John. Okay, thank you. Adora. So I, I think uh, a lot of it is uh, informed guess because the mode of uh, hunting, the location, uh, a lot of this kind of hints to whether or not it was killed for a targeted, uh, you know, trade uh, product or accidentally. But also, of course, uh, there is, you know, very often the a tiger killed for skin will not be detected in the forest. You know, it'll just disappear. The body will be thing. So you, what you detect is actually the skin somewhere else. But the animals that are accidentally killed will still be there and their nails might be taken off or canines might be uprooted. So I, I think that I would not say yes, we know for sure, but I think they're pretty informed guesses that we are making at this point. Okay, yeah, and that, that's one of the big challenges of dealing with wildlife crime, isn't it? This silent victim syndrome where Tigers can't report. Nobody's reporting the crime. Or, or very, very, you know, tigers can't speak, and and very few people are reporting it. So. Okay. Well, we, I think we've come to the 
the end of our session here. Um, I want to thank all of you panelists for for sharing your your time and your expertise with us. It's been certainly for me has been a, a big learning experience, and I hope uh, um, everybody in the audience feels the same way. Um, we've learned an awful lot about wildlife crime and and uh, specifically for tigers. Um, thank you to to all the participants, the audience who have who've joined in. There's well over 100 people in the room today and so that's really nice to see and i appreciate your taking the time to listen to all of us um, with that i think we'll wrap it up yeah thank, thank you, you so much it was wonderfully thank conducted you. thank you john thank you so much it's thank been you. my pleasure yeah. thank you john thank you Girisha. thank you Uttara Daigo, for joining Thank you, everyone. Hi, Abhishek. I could see you now. Yeah, Hi, Abhishek. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to just uh, say a quick, uh, you know, word of thanks to everybody who, uh, of course, there, there's a whole, uh, you know, back end team who made this work and make made this successful and made sure that there were no technical glitches. Uh, so yeah, so thanks to everybody. It's a, a huge shout out. I'm sorry I don't have my slide with all the names, uh, but you all know. Who you are so uh you know thanks so much uh i'd also like to thank of course uh, john goodrich for um rating the session he woke up really early this morning uh from colorado and and ran this for us thanks for that uh also my thanks to all the panelists uh, uh mr Gurishev from uh, wctb uh you know thanks sir thanks so much for your time uh i'm sure it must be a busy week uh but uh hope this was a nice way to close your friends uh, also, thanks to um, Mervyn and Uttara, uh, our uh, friends uh, and colleagues. And uh, Diego, thanks for uh, dialing in from the UK. I know you have a work day left to go, so I'll leave no you uh, Thanks again. Thanks thanks to everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks to the team at the back end in this uh, work. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's